We journalists always like to, you know, try to sum up the mood of, of any discussion we've had or the, the state of any industry in these sort of binary terms of optimism or pessimism. But you four all sound determinedly optimistic in a business sector which, you know, for the last three or four years has taken a huge number of knocks, bruises and lumps. Is that because you think now it's reached a point where the only way is up? Or are there some very specific sort of, I don't know, macroeconomic reasons why you think now is the time for optimism? Who, who wants to take this? No, really? I, I think we're being realistic. Um, you know, we've gone through a, a difficult period, but I think it's a very different industry today than it was 10 years ago. I think far too many people, when commenting on the industry, look at what it was like, you know, in the... Uh, 90s and the early part of the, the last decade, rather than realizing how it's it's evolved over the past uh, 10 years in particular. So, you know, you have seen consolidation, you have seen weak airlines fail, you've seen changes in the cost base with fuel moving from, you know, $20 a barrel in 2001 to $100, $110 a barrel, which changes the, the behavior in the industry because uh, fuel is a variable cost. So we've gone from an industry that had traditionally very high fixed costs and in, into an industry that has more variable costs. Michael's probably got the most variable cost base around, so he can adapt capacity by taking capacity out and putting capacity in much quicker than mm. the industry would have done. And we've all become better at doing that. So I, I, I just think it is different, and uh, I think the focus of the industry is very different today than it was. But is there any doubt in any of your minds that... <laughs> The, the, the growth potential, and that is, in essence, the fact that more and more people will want to fly remains absolutely, you know, as strong as ever in Europe. Because, you know, there are other factors at work. European governments committed to climate change action, committed to, they say, you know, more green policies. We see it in taxation of fuel and things like that. <coughs> at some point, maybe your faith in the ability of the, you know, the, 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 the market to keep expanding uh, will be proven to be misplaced. Well, you just think there's going to be more and more passengers out there almost I don't forever. Know. I think the reality is, and I, you haven't heard anything different from any of the speakers this morning, the, the fares will come down in Europe over the next number of years, and as average airfares come down, demand will rise until somebody invents Star Trek travel. Uh, air travel around Europe will continue. But to how can you be so sure year. fares will keep coming down? Because you can't, you don't dictate taxation policies, for example, and sort of climate no, but change. The taxation policies, as we, we, we will ultimately fail. You know, you've seen various governments introduce travel taxes, and at one, you know, when they realise it, it kills the tourism industry, either amend or withdraw them. I mean, the European, the ETS scheme is a disgrace at this stage. It's become a, a, a laughing stock around the world. We're now just taxing only the short haul travel within Europe as our contribution to climate change, God help us, but the long haul flights make no contribution no, at I know, all because but, but the, the Chinese you and the be, Americans I mean, told the Europeans I, to go stuff it. Yeah, I dare say all of you on the panel hate that. You hate the ETS system. You hate the um, passenger duties in the UK. And it's all not that. what we hate. It's the system doesn't but, work. But the point is, you say that, but there's no sign of any government lifting them. And in fact, frankly, if I were to bet over the next 20 years, I would think the tax regime for you lot will get worse, not better. So. How, how can you be so optimistic that you can keep driving fares down and down and down? I think we tend to disagree that no government is listening. I think step by step governments are changing some of their policies. The only problem is when national governments are withdrawing them, Brussels is taking them over with, with new initiatives, which, as, as Michael rightfully points out, eventually will fail, and you cannot address a global problem on a European scale. And, and, and again, I, I guess more and more national governments are realizing that aviation is making a very significant contribution to the economy, be it tourism, be it international investment, be it what, whatever uh, way it's, it's contributing a lot. Mm. And, and I guess national governments are seeing that. The big challenge is now to make sure that Brussels is also withdrawing some of their new hobbyism and to see aviation as a catalyst for growth and economic prosperity rather than as an endless source of taxation and a, and a milking cow for whatever other projects are to be funded. Yeah. But I think if we're wrong, and I don't think we are, but if we are wrong, we'll adapt to it. That's the big difference. The industry can quickly adapt, much more quickly adapt to changing 
uh, uh, circumstances because we've had plenty of experience of doing that. Now, where we struggle is to adapt quickly to short-term shocks, you know, so volcanic ash or, as I call it, clear blue skies, you know, when they stop us flying. That's, yeah. It's difficult to adapt sure. to a seven-day closure of European airspace. But to changing fuel prices, changing taxation, changing regulations, the industry is much more adaptable today than it ever was. So the, the fuel price outlook doesn't really worry you at all? No. no. Is that I, true I, of all of you? Yeah, it's, uh, it's again, uh, fuel cost is, uh, is a cost uh, all airlines have, and it's uh, how we see it. It's all relative again, if you have the best... Uh, Actually, in Norway, you've got fossil fuels coming out of every orifice. You should be quit. Yeah. Quit, 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 quit in. We should have uh, tapped into that. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, do you not get very, very cheap fuel just because no. you're in there? Um, but, but, I mean, we, see it, we saw it just last couple of weeks, didn't we, as the Syria story got more and more... Uh, serious and military strikes seemed um, uh, imminent, uh, the price of oil spikes again. I mean, but yeah, but it's, saying it's, that doesn't it, it spiked from 110 to $118 a barrel. Mm. Uh, you know, it didn't go uh, from 110 to 150 or $200 a barrel, which is maybe what people would have expected. So again, uh, I think globally we're probably getting used to these geopolitical you know, shocks as well. Yep, it, it, it does impact on our industry. What is interesting about Syria is uh, from a, uh, you know, look, if I look at it from a BA point of view, and we don't fly into Syria, but we fly into the, the region, mm. absolutely no impact on bookings, with mm. the exception of, you know, fortunately, BBC journalists and cameramen traveling mm. in business class to go down to cover it, so we got a benefit. Um, so you're but, sounding more and more like him. Booking, <laughs> booking late and then high yields. <laughs> Yeah, well, let's move swiftly on. Um, right, I'm going to open it up. So you've got your hand up. We'll get a microphone to you. Just hang on. Hello. Uh, question for, especially for Peter and Frode. Um Peter, your group obviously was talked about a bit yesterday, have developed a so-called lower cost operation in France by consolidating three money losing operations into one sort of half consolidated operation in HOP. Uh, Frodo, you stated quite clearly that you're, you're in a good cost position for Scandinavia. It's relative, but when you move out of Scandinavia with the current aircraft order you have, it's a bit hard to compete with IAG's Welling or, of course, the Ryanair. Um, aren't you a bit concerned that no matter what you do with your existing cost space, that you're still going to hit a wall of opportunity growth? Peter and then Frodo, maybe? Well, well, clearly, uh, within the Air France KLM group, uh, we have to deal with the European network where we do have different uh, models working sort of parallel with each other. One of the issues for, for the Air France group was to address the issue of, of domestic and intra-European operations, and, and the model was chosen, as, as you rightfully point out. Um, and that's a gradual process. We are not starting with a blank sheet of paper. We are coming from somewhere, and we transforming that into a new model. And of course, there's, there's criticism along the line saying, hey, will it work? And if you combine three losing operations into one, minus, minus, and minus does not necessarily make plus. But, but we, we, we need to transform, and we will transform, and we're very confident that we will succeed in transforming also that part of our business into a sustainable part. That's not only driven by, by, the, by, the, by the, the low cost entry into the market, but also by trains, which is a, a new reality in the market where we, we do have to, to adjust. Um, so tra trains, Peter, did you say? Trains for the domestic. Yes, I mean, I, it, it, actually, it's coming up after our break. We're talking about high-speed trains, and we haven't touched on that really as an issue for you guys in terms of competition, but in, in, you really feel it, do you? Oh, for, for Air France, it's, it's an issue for the domestic flights, and, and that was part of the question of the gentleman there uh, with reference to HOP. I guess cross-border trains in Europe are still miles and miles away from anything which is competitive to planes. Well, I think we might have that challenged a bit later on, but anyway, but let's not go there yet. I just want to hear... That was my warming up there for the challenge later on. <laughs> uh, Frodo, the, the question was also to you, so uh, what's your response? Okay, so, so how, how I get, uh, took that uh, question, uh, I think the uh, point for Norwegian uh, coming from Scandinavia into Europe is uh, we have a, a very competitive cost basis out of Scandinavia. When we do expand and set up bases in Europe, uh, our cost basis on those bases will be even better 
because again of the labor cost, the efficiencies we get out of uh, uh, our, our labor force uh, at those spaces. So the weighted average cost of, of uh, in our group will come drastically down. And on this basis we'll be in a even better competitive uh, position to, to, to meet the price, uh, price uh, situation in, in Europe. Do you feel you've taken a gamble? Not at all. You don't look like a natural gambler. But you, you know. I'm not a gambler. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but you do have to love the Air France, God bless them, you know, the, the strategy of putting together three kind of loss making dogs and hoping that if you stick the three <laughs> together it'll make money, then calling it HOP, which as you know stands for high ordinary prices, <laughs> and putting that forward as being the low fare future for French consumers. <laughs> you just got to love that kind of strategically visionary thinking. Peter, are you, are you feeling the love there from Ryanair? <laughs> I'm perfectly yeah, comfortable actually. Sure. <laughs> uh, all right, next one, sir, at the front. Uh, yeah, sorry, can we get a mic down here? We've got a couple at the front. Oh, you could just shout, that's true. Hi, Bernie Baldwin from Low Fire and Regional Airlines. Um, Fred, uh, you are alone in, oh, Oh, yes, alone in Europe in terms of the product you have on board in delivering free Wi-Fi um, amongst the low fare airlines, that is. Um, Michael did try some connectivity with On Air a little while ago. Do you think you might come to that, come back to that? And for Froda, how much of a how much of a differentiator do you see it as you develop bases outside Scandinavia? Well, thanks for bringing up uh, Wi-Fi and, and internet on board or, uh, on board our planes. It's uh, definitely uh, something we are uh, so far uh, is the only airline in Europe to, to offer, and um, it's a great uh, success for us. We have 50, 60 percent of our passengers uh, logged on online uh, uh, at all times, and uh, if we were to enter into a discussion on how are the products different. Uh, and uh, are the different difference uh, really attracting uh, volume, demand, moving demand? I think the Wi-Fi solution and the Wi-Fi product is uh, one of that kind. And it's going to stay free, is it? It's going to stay free. No. Oh, I can't believe you lot aren't doing that too. I mean, no, I, I think everybody will have Wi-Fi at some stage. Uh, you know, our view is there are a number of different systems out there. They're not all going to succeed. It's the classic VHS Betamax. You know, we don't, we, don't, oh, we, don't, we don't want to buy the Betamax. Which, which uh, system do you use, Frodo? We have a Roam 44 as provider of our internet uh, services. So it, it will get there. The, the challenge for British Airways is if we're going to do it, we want to do it globally. And you know, it's yeah. one thing doing it geographically over Europe. It's another thing doing it you know, across the Atlantic, across the uh, Pacific. So, but it will happen. It's only a question of when. And I think the challenge is... Have you got a time frame on it? I'm sure you've chewed this over at, back at HQ. Yeah, no, we, we debate it all the time. But you know, if you look at the US where they've introduced it and charged for it, the take-up there is very, very low. Penetration is, is very low. Yeah. Performance is very low. Uh, so, you know, it's still a, a de developing area. I don't think it's going to become, you know, a USP because everybody will copy it. And that's what I said earlier on. If somebody does something smart and succeeds, everybody is going to copy them. Yeah. I think would you all see the challenge for us in Europe? I have no doubt that it'll come in the next three to five years. But certainly within Europe, or you're flying internationally in Europe, you need much lower comms charges and much lower roaming charges. And until you get there, there's simply no point in wasting time on Wi-Fi. We find every time you offer one of our passengers, you can have an, an average 40 euro airfare on Ryanair, or you can have a 90 euro Norwegian fare with free Wi-Fi. Funnily enough, they all clamber for the 40 euro airfare and screw the Wi-Fi. But you know, maybe ours just a little less Wi-Fi enabled. I think anyway, for Norwegian, where the history has been much more kind of intra-Scandinavian and domestic flights within Norway, Wi-Fi was, vi was a viable option. I think on international flights, particularly with the cost of roaming charges, it is less so, but I think they will continue to come down, and over the next three to five years, I expect, certainly on short-haul flying, we'll be adding Wi-Fi to most of our flights, but only when it's cheap and affordable to do so. Yeah, and good news for you, because there's another way you can squeeze a bit more juice out of your customer. And lower those fares even further. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, uh, more questions, yeah. Uh, Mr. Leary, I wonder if I could ask you the same question I put a little bit earlier uh, to Willie Walsh. Uh, the question of I how... I can't imagine there's a question you could put to me and Willie. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was suggesting that some airlines um, irritate 
their customers. I think you put it slightly I more think it's true. That's right. I have loads of pastors who are pissed off at BAs, flight delays, lost bags, <laughs> <laughs> arsing around in T5 where occasionally they have to sleep in the ballroom of the Sofitel Hotel. I find my 81 million passengers don't have those kind of problems, never irritated by delays, cancellations, lost bags, which is why we feel the love on a daily basis in Ryanair. People just can't get enough of those cheap fares. Oh, jeez, you're irritating me now. <laughs> <laughs> The truth hurts, what can we say? <laughs> Let's go to the question, shall we? Well, we're glad to add to the uh, game. we did. Point. How low can you go and what sort of things have you got in the pipeline? I mean, you've flown a few kites in the past, but, but realistically, what are, what are the practical things where you see you might be able to charge or bring in some new innovative pricing? Uh, you know, the difficulty with that kind of question, you know, it, at the moment our lowest fare is 14.99. It's available on about, you know, there's about a million seats available currently through the end of September, October, November at 15 quid one way uh, out of 15 airports here in the UK. Can it go lower? Yes, I think it can. Uh, what are we doing and what will we be trying to do? I think our focus for the next number of years is still to take out airport costs, uh, particularly the handling element of the, uh, the airport costs, which are very expensive. I think looking to the future, we'll also be looking at uh, more efficient re-engined aircraft, more efficient uh, engines. Uh, can we put more seats onto planes is an area where I'm very keen on. Uh, you know, I've long been an advocate of taking out some of the toilets and replacing them with more seats, which would automatically to lower fares for everybody. I know it cracks jokes all over the world. What will the people do? Poor old Gerard Depardieu, but uh, he couldn't wait to go to the toilets on Air France. Um, yeah, so if, if we had simple answers, we'd already have announced them and we'd be implementing them. I think the difference between Ryanair and most of the other so-called low fare airlines I know is we remain committed to lowering those airfares. The rest of them talk about product differentiation, or as Frodo has uh, rightly said today, well, they come up with this spiel about, well, we don't really compete with Ryanair because uh, they're at a sort of Riga airport and we're at um, uh, Gardamon. I mean, the only reason we're at different airports is because Oslo Norwegian couldn't wait to get the hell out of Riga once we showed up. It's good strategy is stay out of our way. Uh, but the reality is none of them can compete with us on price. They want to find new ways of getting airfares up. We intend to continue to find new ways of getting airfares down. And I suspect that over the longer term, across the piece, most of the airlines will see low fare, short haul, air, uh, short haul fares in Europe come down. And I think they will continue to manage up the long haul, uh, long haul prices. And if you succeed in leading that charge downwards, do you see more airlines going out of business in the next five years? Yes, I mean, in the next year or two, there'll be more airlines going out of business. I mean, there's an inexorable move across Europe. There's going to be the, sort of the five big major airlines, which would be the BA, IAG family, Air France, uh, Lufthansa, EasyJet, and Ryanair. There'll be a few other niche airlines around the piece, but many of those will gradually get smaller. Uh, or get absorbed into the, the, the big three uh, I'm just, companies. I'm just thinking about these 222 planes that Fred has just bought. And it, you, you seem to be suggesting you're not entirely sure that was the right thing to be doing. I'm not sure it's the right thing to be doing, you know, but the, world, the graveyards of the airlines are littered with airlines who bought too many aircraft, couldn't afford to pay for them, and blew themselves up. Uh, I think the ones who have succeeded over the long term are the ones who have grown relatively, at a relatively steady pace over many years. And I think clearly in the low cost space, I think the challenge for Norwegian, like Norwegian's a very good airline, we in a kind of Scandinavian sense, uh, their pricing is low relative to SAS, but you know, almost everybody's pricing is low relative to SAS. <laughs> their operational performance is better than SAS, but then almost everybody's operational performance is better than SAS. The challenge I think for Norwegian, you know, it's nothing that they wouldn't accept themselves, when you come outside of uh, that kind of uh, Scandinavian uh, air, 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 area, how do you compete with EasyJet mm. at Gatwick? How do you compete with Ryanair at Alicante? And I'm not sure, given their cost structure and their pricing, that they've yet demonstrated an ability to do that. It'll clearly be a challenge, and it's one I, you know, but it's one the more they try to compete with the likes of us in EasyJet, I think the more consumers will benefit. But I certainly don't see any signs of us losing any passengers to Norwegian who have moved out of stances to get away from us because it's easier to compete with EasyJet at Gatwick. Good strategy. 
Well, when our cost bases are the same, uh, Michael, and we have Wi-Fi, maybe they will travel with us. <laughs> <laughs> Can, can, can I just check? <laughs> I, I hope after this conference he's going to give me some of what he's smoking if he thinks our cost, <laughs> if he thinks our cost base is the same. <laughs> Jesus, I need some of that stuff. It's, it's, cool. not, uh, it's not to worry. I have to come just, to that. Just to pick up on what uh, Stephen Sacker was raising on the, on the safety issues, wh where are you um, in relation to uh, your dispute with the Spanish safety watchdog report? Um, because I know at the time uh, there was some um, concern within Ryanair. Um, and I'm just reading from the report itself. This is in relation to the 2010 uh, Stansted Alicante flight. Yeah. Uh, the, the wording of the, of the report, which I know, I know you had issues with, but the well, report. Issues with it is disgraceful, it's factually inaccurate. Well, because uh, the report said the company's fuel saving policy. Though it complies with the minimal legal requirements, tends to minimise the amount for fu of fuel with which its aeroplanes operate and leaves none for contingencies below the legal minimums. And then it went on to say this contributed to the amount of fuel used being improperly planned and to the amount of fuel on board dropping below the required final fuel reserve. That, that, that's the wording from the report. I know you had issues with that. Where, where are the, oh, we don't have issues. It's factually untrue. I mean, look, you can't operate 700,000 flights a year. In the last three years, we've had three fuel emergencies all on one day in, due to adverse weather in Madrid. Like, our record speaks for itself. It's not a question we have said that the report is factually untrue. The Irish, uh, the AAIU, which is the accident investigation branch of the Irish Aviation Authority, has taken it up with the Spanish authorities. The report was written without, I mean, they, the, as the Spanish, only the Spanish can manage it, they managed to exclude almost all of the input that Ryanair gave them, which is actually our fuel policy is the same as everybody else's fuel policy. Our pilots are told if you want extra fuel, take it. We don't have a policy of flying on minimum fuel. None of our aircraft operate on minimum fuel because our minimum fuel includes already planned in extra. So the report is untrue, inaccurate. The Irish authority demanded the Spanish authorities withdraw the report. And if they don't, then we'll be demanding they would draw the report. Well, that's, that's, that's cleared that up. Um, lady here, we'll get you a microphone. Uh, we've, got, we've got a couple minutes left, so let's keep these snappy. We'll have a couple more and we'll keep them quick. Uh, Lene Kaspersen, journalist in Business Daily Norway, to Frodo Foss and Michael Leary. Is it really possible to run a long haul operation with only two planes? And to Michael Larry, how many planes do you need to start your uh, considered long haul right, operation? Right, Frodo first, yeah. Well, on the operating long haul with two planes, that's uh, you're doing that today, so it's sort of it it it, it works, but it's but not you, very efficient. Yeah, that's why because you have had a lot of problems, and Bjorn Schulz, your own boss, he was supposed to go to Bangkok, as and he's stuck in Oslo now. Uh, <laughs> That's why I'm here. He's got free Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> he's playing with free Wi-Fi uh, as we speak. S surrounded by a bevy of Asian cabin crew who they employed in Dublin, where, as you know, there's a huge uh, spike upwards in unemployed <laughs> Asians. <laughs> No, it's, it's a really a challenge uh, for us right now. We have only two aircraft. We just started up and uh, we have some uh, difficulties with, uh, with the aircraft. So by all means, that's uh, very unfortunate. Uh, then again, if you are going to, to launch uh, long haul, uh, it's not that many other ways to do it. Unless you buy a long haul operation or you have 20 aircraft to start off with, that's not possible. When are you six more coming? We have one more in November, uh, another uh, February next year, April next year, and then two more by tw uh, 2015. Yeah. Well, let us know when your boss gets out of Oslo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael, quick. Which is why there's a huge drain on Asian cabin crew in the Dublin market at the moment. They're all flooding towards Norwegian as we speak. Um, our model, uh, the plan we've worked on, would require a minimum order between 40 to 50 long-haul aircraft. You'd want to start with seven in year one, uh, building up at a rate of seven a year. So you'd go 7, 14, 21, 28 over a four-year period, serving initially three European cities to three U.S. cities and building over a five-year period to serving 10 European cities to 10 U.S. cities.
activities. So you may not be actually planning to do it, but you've got a pretty clear model of how you would do it if you were going to do it. Actually, we have a plan for every eventuality. You know, I wouldn't worry. <laughs> if plans are easy, but it's actually implementing them that's the challenge. Right. I'm going to have to say uh, last question, and just I'm afraid randomly, I'm going to because you sir had your hand up before. I'm going to go for you. So, uh, can we get you the microphone down to the end of the row there? I'm really sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but we are almost out of time. Got to get the exciting railways in <laughs> next to entertain you all. <laughs> Jeez, this conference just gets better and better. You, you speak for yourself, mate. I'm looking yeah, forward to it. Sorry, uh, Robert Wall with Bloomberg. Just a question for, I guess, for, for Willie. You talked about the, the welling costs at the start of your uh, presentation. And uh, talk, could you talk a bit about the challenge you think you'll face of maintaining that cost, the low cost advantage you see there within the IAG culture? And perhaps, Michael uh, O'Leary, do you think Willie can, can do it? Or are German wings and welling doomed to, to fail like Ted did at United? No, there's absolutely you know, no comparison. The problem with Ted is Ted was part of a United Airlines where it was the same management running it, and you know, there, were, there was interference making sure that you know, Ted did not work. IAG is structured so that these are independent operating companies, each with their own focus. So Alex Cruz is running uh, Welling, and will continue to run it in the way he has done. He's got a very clear successful track record he will benefit from any synergies that we can generate for him but we're not going to do anything to change his business model so uh, that's the difference in the past uh, you know so british airways and go go was established to compete with Ryanair. Uh, the go management team recognized that it was actually easier to compete with british airways than to compete with Ryanair, and and that's what happened you cannibalize your your own business you know we've structured in a way that will not allow that to happen the focus is very clear uh, and that's why I believe we will succeed. So if, if BA can learn smart th things from Welling, or Iberia can learn smart things from Welling, then great. Uh, but we're not going to interfere with the way Alex Cruz and his team runs that business. And that's why it will continue to succeed. And they will continue to have a cost advantage uh, over most of their competitors. I acknowledge you know, the, the Ryanair cost base is the lowest, and we're not there. But we have a lower cost base than uh, Norwegian in the markets that we're operating in, and a lower cost base than uh, ECGS. And I think, from my perspective, I think he's probably read the Willie's is probably right. I think German Wings has no hope, no prospect of succeeding. I mean, Lufthansa have had about five goes at setting up a low fare airline. They don't believe in it. Uh, they may uh, transfer some of the short haul loss making Lufthansa operations to it, but ultimately, it is doomed to fail in the same way that every other so-called low fare effort by a high fare airline has equally failed. They ultimately always morph back into being just a, some kind of bastardized version of the high fare parent. Uh, and that's sure takes the same for Ted, German Wings, got even Peter Transavia, God bless us, which again masquerades as a, it's a low cost airline, but only if you're Dutch. Um, I think the interesting thing about whaling actually is it's Dutch, Dutch, not Dutch. Dutch. <laughs> I'm Irish, so we're always linguistically a bit challenged. Um, <laughs> The interesting thing I think about whaling actually is that I suspect it's one of the ones that, uh, that it has a real prospect of success for two reasons. One uh, is that, uh, you know, Willie gets it, uh, I think, uh, you know, and within IAG, he has enough cop on to know this isn't a kind of a BA startup low fares, or it's not an Iberia startup low fares. It did start up as a separate startup in Spain. It has its own culture, and whereas uh, IAG have acquired it now, I think they have enough cop on to know leave it alone. I think the, it will be, continue to be very cost competitive with the likes of EasyJet and Norwegian in the Spanish market. I don't think it will be cost competitive with Ryanair, but it doesn't need to be cost competitive with Ryanair. As long as it's cost competitive, with EasyJet in Norwegian, it can happily expand in, uh, in Spain. It may continue to help him to address cost issues within Iberia or Iberia Express. I don't think the Iberia Express model will, will work over time, but I think Vueling has a real chance of success, partly because I think Willie will, will knows well enough not to kind of screw around with it, let it be separate within the group, and not try and impose either a BA or an Iberia philosophy upon it. So I think it's one of the ones that could succeed down there. 
All right. Well, listen, everybody, it, it's been a fascinating couple of hours. I've really enjoyed myself. The good sign is always when there's questions left on the floor. I apologize if you had a question we haven't got to, but at least it shows we haven't tested your patience too much. Uh, but before we go, let me just say to Willie, to Peter, to Michael, and to Froda, thank you so much for being on the panel, and please give them a very warm hand.